All right, folks, welcome back to the channel and to another episode of Workshop Wednesdays. I'm Christian Williams, better known as the Hickory Hacker, and uh, we're in my little golf shrine here today. Uh, I've got a lot that I want to try to cover in this episode of Workshop Wednesdays. Uh, not necessarily new things to show you in the workshop, but some updates to some projects that I did in the past that uh, I've received some helpful tips toward or for. So, um, you know, basically uh, what I want to do today is kind of catch up on some of those things um, and then kind of prep you for what's coming up in the future. Um, so we'll start with uh, where we're at right now and the photo that I posted on Monday. Um, I kind of gave you a little teaser uh, as to a, a recent fresh find that I had, and I wanted to show those clubs to you today because I think they're pretty cool. Um, so I've got them sitting next to me right here. We'll give you some close-ups of some of these clubs in the workshop, but uh, I'll just kind of brush over these real quick to show you what I got. So if you noticed in the video or in the, the photo that I posted on Monday, uh, there were, you know, these clubs were kind of poking out and uh, were the most noticeable ones in the, in the lot. There were two bags, uh, basically these, you know, canvas bags like this, uh, two bags in an antique shop in uh, Westerly, Rhode Island. And I actually got a tip on these clubs being there from a friend of mine on Instagram. Uh, he may also be a, a viewer of or a subscriber to the channel. Um, but uh, yeah, really appreciate the tip on that. Um, so anyway, uh, the clubs, the, the clubs that I saw that looked most interesting were obviously the woods. Um, and uh, these are metal. Um, a lot of times when you see metal woods like this, the assumption is that they were made by a company called Peterson. Uh, they were the most notable manufacturers of metal uh, woods in the Hickory era. Um, and that's what I thought these were when I saw the picture. But when I got to them, I found something what I think is probably more interesting. Um, so the only writing you could see on this particular club is spoon. And um, basically, that didn't really help me much. Um, but fortunately, there's also a driver whoops, that I could tell was part of the same series. And there I could actually read that it's at Ampco, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I referred to the handy North American Club Maker book by Pete Georgity to figure out what exactly I was looking at. And I was very happy to find that these clubs were made around 1925 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is one of my former hometowns. I lived there for nine years and my mom still lives up there. So uh, it was really cool to find these clubs in Rhode Island. Uh, and these weren't the only Amcos in the bag. Um, I had the two woods here, driver and a spoon, and then also a short set of irons. So we've got the mid iron, the mashie, the niblick, and this really interesting putter um, that's very heavy. Uh, it's kind of almost looks like it might be ambidextrous. I mean, to my eye, it looks like the loft on the putter end is probably about eight degrees. And then on this end, it's probably more like 18 to 20 degrees. So kind of an interesting club because you could use this as a right-handed putter. You could use it as a left-handed chipper. Uh, or if you're a righty and you're in a kind of a tough spot, you could use this as sort of a rescue club left-handed to kind of chip yourself out of trouble. So uh, I think this is pretty cool. It's also, you know, weighted really well. Um, I would say it's probably about D0. I haven't checked it yet, but uh, it's got some heft to it. Uh, so really interesting putter. Um, all of these made by Ampco in Milwaukee. Um, you know, really not, um, I guess the most noteworthy thing about them is actually the materials that the clubs are made out of. They're, they're not particularly, they don't look like they're going to be particularly great play clubs necessarily. Uh, they're a little light and swing weight. Um, I haven't tried hitting a ball with them yet though. So I might come back to you and say, no, these clubs feel great. But the reason why I'm not quite sure they're going to be great players um, is because the alloy that they used to make these clubs was a proprietary metal that they called Ampco metal or uh, Dow metal. Actually, let's, you know, before I start guessing, let's just look it up and I'll tell you exactly what they called it. Um, so they began producing clubs in their proprietary alloy Ampco metal. Ampco was yellowish in color when polished and harder than steel. The special resilience the company claimed made their clubs hit the ball further than normal iron heads. They were also guaranteed by the company for 20 years against breakage, chipping, rust, or corrosion. So uh, 
what I think is interesting about this, besides what I just read, is that it's indicative of a time period in golf club manufacturing when companies were willing to take kind of, you know, bigger risks with what they were doing with clubs to make, you know, pr to produce something more original or unique. Um, this is a time frame when wooden shafts were starting to uh, phase out a little bit. The introduction of the uh, Bristol um, metal shaft with the pyrotone covering uh, had already happened by 1925, uh, I believe. And uh, so you're already starting to see a change in the shafts, which is opening people's mind to other possibilities. Now, there are always golf club manufacturers trying to do something unique um, to make their clubs interesting. Uh, but I think this is interesting because this was a company that felt like they could make, uh, kind of reinvent the wheel some, somewhat in coming up with a different material for heads that they claimed would be harder than steel. And they figured that was probably the right time to try this because people were more willing to try something different with their golf clubs now that they saw that the shafts were changing. Uh, that's just my theory. I don't know if any of that's totally true, but, uh, that's, that's what I'm going with. So it says on here harder than steel, and uh, I've already alluded to this a couple times. The reason why I don't know how well these are going to play is, uh, in my experience, a club that says it's harder than steel probably feels like it's harder than steel when you hit a ball. So I don't expect that this is going to be like a forged, you know, soft metal forged feel when you hit a ball. Uh, I feel like it's going to probably feel like you're hitting a, hitting a rock. Um, but I could be totally wrong about that, and I want to try these clubs out to see um, I'll take them out for a round at some point and, and kind of report back on them. Uh, it's interesting that they offered a guarantee on chipping because the Niblick already kind of suffered that fate in a few spots. Um, so they obviously knew that uh, even though it's harder than steel, it, it's not as resilient as some clubs. But, you know, Niblick is going to get beat up pretty well anyway. So that's not surprising. And it's not in a playable area, so I think it'll be okay uh, to play with. Um, but anyway, yeah, that, that was kind of, it was interesting to find these clubs and especially with the two woods, um, you know, conventional wisdom would suggest that I keep all these clubs together and sell them as one big lot of Amco clubs, basically a short set with two woods. Um, I may do that. Uh, but I do think just on first glance, the playable clubs in this are going to be the driver and the putter. Um, cause, and the Niblick, cause everything else is a little light on swing weight. But, um, I think for a collector or somebody who's got Milwaukee connections like me, um, this would probably be a pretty appealing set to pick up just from a collectible standpoint. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned the driver specs, but the driver is, uh, 10 degrees of loft, uh, currently D3 swing weight with the, uh, original grip on it and 43 inches long. So it's got all the specs of a great play club uh, for a driver. Um, also, I did not mention this. Uh, so you see that this, this uh, alloy on the irons is kind of a bronze color. What they did was they also took uh, a piece of that metal and put it as a metal insert in the, uh, the head of both the, the driver and the spoon. So you're hitting off of the same material as you are with the irons. I think that's kind of, uh, you know, ingenious uh, because you theoretically would have the same feel off both the, your, your woods and your irons that way. Um, I don't know what this material, what this metal is. I believe this is another proprietary Amco metal. It's not aluminum. It's kind of like aluminum. Um, but uh, yeah, it, um, it's going to be real interesting to see how these play. Um, I'm not sure it'll show up here, but uh, the shaft is bore through, and then there's even a spot on the hosel where it's pinned. So the shaft is is really well attached to the head, and um, it's in good shape too. It's straight, no cracks that I can see, no warps. Um, so I think everything is probably pretty good to go as as this club is concerned. Uh, I'll just put a different you know new grip on it, uh, which will probably affect the swing weight a little bit. Probably knock it down from D3 to maybe D0, uh, but still completely playable uh, swing weight. And um, yeah, we'll see how these play. So this was, uh, this was the first part of that batch, um, sort of something that I, you know, I could kind of tell that those were interesting from the photo that I posted, uh, that, uh, Al Kim, uh, who, who gave me the tip, he's the, the, the person who sent me that photo, um, and intrigued me to drive out to Westerly in the middle of a, a minor snowstorm. It wasn't too bad, three to five inches, something like that. But I felt like I had to get out there pretty quick to find those clubs. 
All right, so we'll just go through real quick the other bag. Um, these were split into two bags, all spread around. You can tell that the owner of the uh, shop didn't really know what he had because he had these Amco clubs separated between the two bags. Uh, but maybe he did know what he did, what he was doing, because that was the incentive to buy both bags. So I'm a sucker, apparently, because I bought both bags. But I'm glad I did, because I think they're interesting clubs. Um, real quick, we'll, you'll see these two uh, in a second here in my update to the rust, uh, rust removal uh, video. Um, but these are two McGregor popular clubs. This is a Mashy Diamondback. This is a Putter um, Diamondback. And uh, yeah, both um, pretty interesting clubs uh, that uh, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with yet. I, I don't know if they're going to become players or what. Um, but those were the test subjects in the update to the rust removal you're about to see uh, in the workshop. And then I wanted to show you these. Uh, well, actually, show you this one first, real quick. This is a Wright and Ditson selected uh, Gutty Era clique. And um, Wright and Ditson used this script uh, stamp probably 1899 to 1902, thereabouts. Um, so this dates to uh, a legal gutty club uh, era. Um, and I think that um, even if it was post-1900, it would probably get an exemption because it, it maintains the characteristics of a gutty era club pretty well. Um, but uh, yeah, this is actually 26 degrees, I believe, and is going to slot in real nice to a gutty set that I'm putting together. Um, so there's that. And then finally, uh, this brassy wasn't really anything special. I believe this is a McGregor, but it's cut down significantly. So I'm going to have to do some major work on that to make it a player again. Um, a couple other just random McGregor clubs, but then these two. So I didn't see these in the pictures. I, I, when I came up to the bag, when I got to the store, I was pleasantly surprised to see this. But what we have here are two Tom Stewart's, um, both kind of tougher clubs to find. Uh, they're both line face, so that probably dates them to mid to late 20s, early 30s even possibly. Um, but uh, the two clubs they are, this is a driving iron, and this is a jigger. Um, so uh, let's start with the driving iron. It's got 19 degrees of loft, and it's D3, so that's great. Um, it's on a shaft right now that's 39 and a half inches long, which... Um, is probably just about right. It seems like it might be a little long for an iron, uh, but I think for the loft, it's probably right on. And it looks like it's the original shaft because it's not cut down or anything. Um, but I'm really excited about this club because I've been trying to find a long iron that I can use off the tee in case my brassy is acting up or if I'm on a long par three where I just want to try to get it, you know, 175, 180 yards out there. Um, I'm really hoping this is the club to do that because I've had a hard time finding that club. Um, and I don't really want to get back into trying to use replica um, spoons or anything like that. Um, so in lieu of finding a 20 degree spoon, this is probably going to be the club that I, I start with first. The shaft on it is still straight. It's also got a really interesting pebble grain grip on it, which I've never seen before. Um, and in fact, it still has some tack to it. So uh, I don't know what the story is on this grip but um, it looks older. Um, I don't know if it's original to the, the club, but uh, I'm going to use Skidmore's on this and clean it up and then try to play it as is because I think the grip is too cool. I don't want to take that off. Um, I'll, you know, update the whipping. This is just regular twine, uh, but uh, I'll reset the head as well. It needs to be reset. It's a little loose in the, yeah, it's got some wobble in the hosel. So, um, We'll, we'll clean that up and try it out, but I'm real excited about that one. And then the jigger, I think, is cool, too. Uh, most jiggers you find are going to have about 30 degrees of loft, 30 to 32. This one has 38, so it's a little bit more lofted than you normally find in a jigger. You can tell that the person who was using this club was using it as a chipper because it's cut down on a shaft that's probably only about 35 and a half inches of play length. Um, so they're using it as a, a jig, as a, a chipper. Um, I would like to put the, uh, right length shaft in here to get this back up to its original jigger playing length, um, which would probably at 38 degrees, I'd probably put a shaft in with a playing length of about 37 and a half to 37 and three quarters, something like that. Um, and I think that'll probably bring the swing weight of this club up to about C9 D0, which is ideal. 
So you, met, you noticed in uh, the latest course vlog I did on the YouTube channel was Cape Nettick uh, Country Club in Maine. And that was the 2021 Maine Hickory Stick Open. And um, I actually started keeping track of score in the course vlogs with that uh, particular video. And um, I wanted to talk about that real quick because uh, I purposefully avoided mentioning score um, through all of my course vlogs for the most part of last year. Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the biggest one is that I really wanted to put the emphasis of me playing hickory golf on the experience of playing with the clubs and playing interesting golf courses with those clubs and not put the focus on my ability. Um, I think that uh, a lot of course vloggers um, and golf course or golf channels on YouTube put a lot of emphasis on the player who's kind of the feature of whatever that channel is. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. Um, but a lot of those guys are good golfers, you know, so there's definitely a reason for them to be the focus of the video. Uh, I purposely wanted to not do that, partly because I, I readily admit that I'm not a good golfer, but I love the game. And I think that my what I bring to the game is a passion for the history of it. And I try to demonstrate that through the clubs that I'm using, through the golf courses that I choose to play, um, and through the stories that I can tell you about those things when I'm doing a course vlog. And I really don't want to put the emphasis on my ability, um, you know, for, for obvious reasons sometimes. Um, so that all said, uh, as I've been using the single plane golf swing that I'm working on with Parker Elrod, um, basically I've, I've decided that I need to have a benchmark for how the, um, how the swing is progressing. Um, Diana, you, you can sit up here, but you can't bite me. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I want to get a benchmark for how my game is progressing with the single plane swing. And the only way to do that is to start keeping score and, you know, comparing previous rounds to where I'm at presently. So I figured Cape Netic was a good one to start that with. I, you know, spent a lot of time putting those graphics together, but I've got a good template for them now. So it shouldn't be too much work for me to keep, continue to do that going forward. And uh, when it's appropriate, when I'm doing a course vlog where it's, you know, really just me showing you um, all the shots, uh, I'm going to keep score and I'm going to start comparing and, and you know, kind of weighing how I'm how I'm progressing. And it's going to help Parker, too, because then he'll be able to see where I'm gaining strokes that I could be trimming strokes and things like that. So there's a dual purpose to it. Um, so that's the practical aspect to it. Uh, I want to just touch on the philosophical aspect of it, too. Um, so middle of last year, uh, there were, there was some complaints that I heard about people calling, uh, about me calling myself a hacker. Um, these were mostly, uh, older golfers who in the Hickory world who found it to be a disparaging remark. And I think, you know, to speak for them in a way, I think they probably were offended by it because they thought that I might've been besmirching Hickory golf by calling myself a hacker. Um, but what I did was I showed them, I did an Instagram post as kind of response. And I, I also say I reached out individually to the people who, um, you know, were, were voicing, you know, displeasure at me calling myself a hacker. And, um, you know, I don't know if that did anything positive or negative or what, but I felt like, it, you know, I, I, I would, you know, take the time to reach out to them personally and kind of, you know, share my perspective on it. And, um, I also did an Instagram post where I didn't, you know, call anybody out, but I addressed the issue and I addressed it by showing my scorecard from the Sarah Bay Country Club, um, Florida Hickory Open. And, uh, if you follow me on Instagram, you saw that post last June. Uh, if you didn't, you know, I recommend you check it out. Um, because, uh, I'm not going to go into length what I talked about in the post here, but, um, I, I did a screenshot basically of my scorecard from one of those rounds and it was a true roller coaster i had like 10 on one hole followed it up with a par i was up and down all over the place and basically what i was trying to demonstrate was that scorecard was indicative of what i think a hacker is somebody who loves the game but who is not very good at it but it plays it despite the fact that they're not good at it and to me personally i think that represents a vast majority of golfers weekend warriors especially who love this game, but uh, just have those kinds of rounds where it's up and down. And you can look at that two different ways. You can say, 
wow, you must have had a really rough day out there and you must be exhausted and, and had a terrible time because your scorecard was a true roller coaster and you were all over the place and you, you carded uh, two tens in one round. I mean, that must that's terrible. Yeah, that's one way you could look at it. And, you, you know, I could have walked away from that round feeling terrible uh, but the only reason I would have felt terrible was specifically about those numbers on the scorecard. It would have completely overshadowed the handful of really good shots that I still remember to this day uh, that I had in that round, and it would have diminished what was otherwise a really enjoyable weekend of golf. How many times have you played golf and your score has been the determining factor as to whether or not you had a good time? That was me all the time before I played hickory golf. And uh, I would get down on myself. I'd come home. My wife would ask me how I played or how I did. Did I have a good time? And I would like, and the first thing I would respond with was what my score was. And that would have been my way of saying, no, I didn't have a good time because I've got this huge number on my scorecard. Um, Hickory Golf taught me that that is the wrong way to approach this game. Um, this is my personal opinion, by the way. So if you disagree, that's fine. And I'm welcome to have this discussion with anybody. Um, but, uh, for me personally to focus on the score that I was scoring, uh, to be the determining factor as to whether or not I was having a good time was basically making me stop play golf. I was at the point before I started playing Hickory golf that I didn't want to show up to the Wednesday night men's league that I was in anymore because I just felt like, what's the point? You know, I've got all this technology in the bag. I can't score well. I'm not having a good time because other players are scoring better than me in the competitions that we have. Why should I play this game anymore? So that's what kind of sent me down the rabbit hole of hickory golf and figuring out how I could re-enjoy, you know, fall in love again with the game of golf and enjoy it differently. So philosophically speaking, I really have a hard time with score to this day because I know how um, poisonous it can be to at least my psyche in determining whether or not I have a good time when I play golf. So when people now ask me, well, what'd you shoot? You know, how, how's, how's your hand, what's your handicap? That kind of question. I'll give them a number, but I'll quickly follow that up by saying, look, I don't really count strokes anymore. I count good shots. You know, when I leave a round of golf, I think back, this is whole accentuate the positive type perspective. I think back on my round and I say, I got five really good shots with my mashie today that I can build upon. Or I had three really decent putts and I got a really long bomb putt that I hit. Um, or I hit two drives that I was really happy with. Those are the things that I'm focusing on when I'm remembering a round, not the final number. Now, um, this is all to say that this is kind of a personal journey within my own head that I have to try to figure out. And it's probably going to be a lifetime thing. I'm probably going to continue to go back as I get better with the single plane golf swing, I'm going to start to kind of trick myself into thinking like, oh, maybe I can start scoring better now and focusing on that part of my game again. Um, but um, I'm really hopeful that I'll maintain the perspective that I'm sharing with you right now because I'm enjoying golf more than I ever did before. And uh, I think that there is a way to coexist with enjoying the game as I've learned how to enjoy it with hickory golf uh, and also keep score but not get hung up on the score. Hickory golf is so much more than the score on your scorecard. Um, it's certainly a good benchmark for how you're progressing as a golfer. It's obviously necessary in competition, but it should by no means ever be the determining factor as to whether or not you're enjoying your round of golf. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm gonna step off my soapbox and we're gonna get into the workshop and we're gonna uh, show you some updates to uh, golf ball creation. Um, I've been making my own golf balls for a while, as you know from a video I posted last year. Uh, and I had a couple updates that I wanted to share uh, with that, some uh, different balls that I've used, um, and answer some questions that people have had about golf ball, um, making my own golf balls with the mesh pattern mold. Uh, and then I also wanna show you the update to rust removal. I'm gonna use a couple of the clubs that I bought in uh, Westerly, Rhode Island. And I'm going to show you a couple different uh, tactics to take rust off of a club that you don't want to remove the head from the shaft. Um, these are brought to me by Martin Wright. This tip that I'm going to show you, Martin Wright and Gavin Vitrell. Gavin runs uh, Time Warp Golf in the UK. He's got a great YouTube channel that's linked in the description. Uh, make sure you're subscribing to his channel as well. Uh, but both Martin and, and uh, Gavin 
and a really good tip for um, removing rust that doesn't involve soaking in evapor rust or vinegar. And I want to show you that in the workshop as well. All right, so I want to give you an update on rust removal. Since I posted the Workshop Wednesday video where I showed the evapo rust process, um, I had a couple tips come through the Facebook post that I did about that project uh, from Martin Wright um, and a couple of the other guys in the UK. Um, and what I found was that uh, there's kind of a preferred method for rust removal in the UK that differs from the soaking method that I was doing with the evapo rust or with vinegar. Um, and I really like it. I think it, it's a really useful, efficient uh, way to get rid of some rust without damaging the patina of the club. And I wanted to show that method to you today, or at least an improvised way of that method. Um, so long story short, uh, the method is using wet emery to scrub off the surface rust of a club. The issue that I ran into was that uh, emery paper, at least the kind of emery paper that I think they're using in the UK, is right now kind of tough to find. Um, Gavin, who runs Time Warp Golf, and you should definitely follow his YouTube channel if you're not already, um, he mentioned that uh, emery paper, which is you know here in the UK or here in the US probably uh, better known as emery sanding cloth, it's different than sandpaper because it's not as rigid. It's got some flexibility to it, uh, and it's got automotive uh, restoration purposes basically. Uh, it comes in a lot of fine grits, um, so you can get it all the way up to 5,000 as a polish, uh, but the prep up to 320 and then maybe even to 360 and to 600, uh, these would be the, the two emery papers that I would probably want to try with the club. Uh, the problem is that the supply chain, like has affected so many other industries because of COVID, um, has impacted this stuff. And so this was the finest grit that I could get at my local uh, auto repair shop. So I'm not gonna use this. The finest grit here is 150 and I think that's too abrasive. Um, so I'm gonna improvise and I'm gonna try steel wool because I've used steel wool uh, to kind of freshen up a club here and there, but I've never tried it um, in the same kind of, uh, you know, procedure as you would use with emery cloth. Um, and really the biggest difference there is wetting it. I'm not sure that you necessarily need to, but I've noticed when I do uh, kind of freshening up projects on a club that it creates a lot of dust. And, um, you know, that's probably not good for the lungs. So uh, what I'm going to do today is take some triple zero steel wool and I'm going to wet it and I'm going to keep the dust pretty much non-existent and uh, see how that does in cleaning this club. Uh, this is one of the clubs that I picked up in the batch of 13 clubs in Westerly, Rhode Island. Uh, this is actually going to go into a gutty set. This is a Wright and Ditson Selected. Uh, dates to probably 1899 to 1902, thereabouts. Um, that's when Wright and Ditson was using this particular label. Uh, the script Wright and Ditson was selected. Um, so I believe this would you know, qualify for a National Hickory Championship uh, event. And um, I'm going to clean it up that way. Uh, it does need to be reset before play. It's got some play in the hosel. So, I mean, I, I'm going to take this, this head off it's at a, and put a different shaft in it, too, by the way. This is only 35 inches um, in play length. So it needs to be longer to start with. But for the purposes of this particular example, I'm going to use this club uh, to kind of show you if um, you didn't want to take the head off of a shaft, how you can get rid of the rust. Um, and there are two really good reasons for why you'd want to do this. Um, one could be that you've recently reset this head and you take it to play and it's wet conditions and you forget to dry it off when you get home and then you let it sit for a day and you've got some surface rust on the club when you come back. Well, rather than taking the head off again and soaking it in evapo rust or vinegar, you can use what I'm about to show you to get rid of the surface rust and maintain the patina of the club. Um, the other instance that you do this uh, process would be if you have a club that you want to sell as is uh, and you don't want to take it off the shaft, even if it's got some play in the hosel, you want to keep its originality intact as much as possible, but you do want it to present a little bit better so you take off some of the surface rust and maintain the patina, and this would be the great way to do that. Um, so let's get into it. I'm going to get some gloves on here. <clears throat> And while I'm doing that, I'm going to tell you a couple of the issues that I ran into with the evapo rust since I last showed you what I thought were pretty cool results. Um, but I've since kind of tempered that enthusiasm for evapo rust. 
Um, this is the Tom Stewart Club, one of the Tom Stewart's that's soaked in the Evaporust. And at first glance, looks pretty cool. It, it looks like a really nice, clean club. But what Gavin noticed, and what I've noticed since then, is that certain clubs will tend to come out a little bit more washed out than you'd want with kind of a duller finish. This one's not so bad. Um, but uh, I've had a couple examples of clubs, not in the workshop, unfortunately, right now to show you, but uh, this one gets close to kind of what Gavin's talking about, where it's just got a little bit of a dull finish to it, even though there's no rust on it. Um, it just kind of looks a little off. And, you know, I think the off part is that it, it it's not that it doesn't look like an authentic club necessarily. It just looks a little artificial, um, maybe even anachronistic, because you'd want it to look a little bit older than this. Uh, this looks like it may have just come out of the forge in certain ways, is, at least as far as the coloring and the patina is concerned. Uh, so I do think the evaporust probably takes too much of the color off of the club. And I think that color is, is because of the rust. So there's kind of a happy medium. Here's an example of a club that was in vinegar. Uh, and vinegar doesn't get rid of as much rust as the evaporust does. So what you end up with is kind of a, it's not a yellow, but it's, it's, a, it's a much more authentic looking patina, in my opinion. Um, and if, if your goal is to try to maintain these clubs uh, and look their age, then I think the vinegar soak is probably better than the evaporust. But you're going to run into people who think this is what the club should look like. They want to have a club that looks like they just bought it from Tom Stewart. So they're going to prefer it to look newer. Um, it's all about preference, really. Um, the other thing, too, is that as soon as you start playing this club and you start to get it wet and it gets dirty, it's going to start to maintain or start to take on more of this patina over time. Um, so it's not a deal breaker if you have this and you feel like you've overworked it. Uh, just start playing it and it'll start to take on age again. But I, I think from a display perspective, people would prefer their clubs to look like this than this. And uh, I think actually the ideal is going to be what I'm about to show you with the steel wool and this Wright and Ditson gutty club. So let's get into that. This is again, triple zero steel wool. I'm using water mostly just to keep the dust down. So I'm just going to start gradually scrubbing. I, I don't believe this club has been cleaned in probably 120, <laughs> 122 years, I would say. Um, so there's a lot of built up rust and grime on here. I want to be careful not to get the shaft wet. So I'm going to get some paper towel here and just kind of hold on to the grip or hold on to the shaft. This was kind of a risky test subject because again, I don't believe this club has been cleaned ever. So it's got a century's worth of oxidation and dirt and grime on it and uh, this method may not clean up as well as uh, you know you might want but I think that it's definitely getting some rust off though it's bouncing up into my face oops I don't want this club to look like one of those evapor rust clubs I mostly just want to take off some of the initial grime here this, I think this patina is baked in here. Let's see if I can clean this area up a little bit more. Because this would be the benefit to doing this. Um, if you're just trying to figure out what a club is, you can't see very clearly what the markings are. You don't want to take the head off. You just want to kind of clear up some of the rust around potential markings. This would be a good method to use. Yeah, it's not really doing too much. I got a little bit of it off here on the sole. But, yeah, I think that patina might be baked in. Uh, but I will show you a couple examples that I did earlier. Both of these had different processes done to them. So I started out with this one. This is a McGregor Popular Mashie Diamondback. Again, another one from the batch in Westerly, Rhode Island. Uh, and I wanted to see what 220 grit sandpaper 
uh, wet 220 grit sandpaper would do. So I, I started cleaning this off. Uh, but as I was going, I started to notice that I was leaving some abrasion marks in areas, especially you could see that on the on the hosel, um, and that was bothering me. I did I, I think 220 was too abrasive for that, and uh, so I stopped using that and uh, set this down. And I I started using the steel wool, and I started on a new club. This was a, a putter from the same batch, and you can see that. This one looks better. Um, there's no abrasion marks. Uh, I was able to get the surface rust off. I was even able to get into the nooks and crannies of the lettering here to remove the surface rust. Uh, but yet, it's still got that mottled patina, which you're you want to, which is what most people are after. Also had some paint on it. There was a whole bunch of paint up here that I was able to scrub off with the triple zero. Um, but generally, you know, I just kind of went around, and there's still plenty of age left on this club but the surface rust is mostly taken off. I did run into some issues down here where there's a lot more rust. If I really wanted to work on this, I could get rid of it with the steel wool, but it doesn't bother me too much. And I'm gonna leave this as is because I think the uh, end game for this club is probably uh, either a, a beginner's play set or will be a display club. Somebody would buy this and put it on display in their man cave or something like that. Uh, the weight on it is pretty, pretty minimal, so it, it might be a decent player for somebody, but generally speaking, I think it's a better display club at this point than a, um, than a play club. Uh, but the grip is original on it. The shaft doesn't have the McGregor shaft stamp, so I'm not quite sure about that, unless maybe it's hidden underneath the grip here. Um, but uh, yeah, the other thing I'll mention too is that uh, what I'll do at this point, you know, now that I've gotten rid of the surface rust, to prevent surface rust from coming back, I'll use skid mores. Uh, you remember from a few workshop work Wednesday videos ago, I mentioned that I use the skid mores to uh, recondition the shaft and also recondition the leather on an original grip. You can also use it on the head as a rust preventant. Um, the beeswax in there will keep water from penetrating the head and also give it a nice little sheen. So I'll actually show that to you right now. Here's the skid mores. A little goes a long way and actually a, a jar lasts a long time. If you end up coming to one of the Gulf Heritage Society shows this year, um, I believe the next one that I'll be at will be in September. There may be one before that. But I've been selling this at the show. I sold two of these pints um, at the Columbus uh, Golf Collector Trade Show and um, uh, people seem to really like it. I've also had some comments from folks. Um, on the YouTube channel, uh, people that have been trying it. So I'm glad people are finding out what I found out too with it, that it's a great product. And it smells awesome too. The workshop smells great every time I walk into it. All right, so I'm just gonna kind of take this and slather it on the head here. And that's pretty self-explanatory but there you go so now it, it even you know helps bring out some of the modeled patina a little bit better uh, gives it a bit of a sheen and most important it uh, protects it from picking up any moisture um, I have noticed if I leave my clubs down in the basement in the summer uh, we get a lot more moisture in the basement at that time and um, my clubs will pick up surface rust just by sitting in the corner in my little golf museum. So um, I'll be applying this to most of probably all the clubs in that um, in that that space down in the basement so that I don't have to deal with any surface rust issues. So yeah, thanks Martin for the uh, tip and Gavin as well. Um, if you want to try the UK method but you can't find emery paper um, I definitely recommend triple zero steel wool as an alternative and then hopefully when we get the supply chain figured out again uh, I'll be able to acquire some 320 grit uh, uh, emery paper and uh, try that I haven't looked on Amazon maybe I could find it there but um, uh, anyway yeah that's that tip uh, and keep the tips coming I really appreciate everybody kind of telling me what's worked for them uh, when I post a video or a social media post about a project I'm doing, um, I'm a novice with this stuff. I'm learning how, as I go and uh, hoping to show you better ways to do this so you can fi figure out for yourself what the best way to go about 
some of these projects is. So keep the tips coming. Thank you. All right, real quick before we wrap up this week's video, I wanted to show you a couple things with golf balls. Um, first is uh, just kind of a, a quick run over of the tools that I'm using to take care of the seam whenever there is one around a ball when it comes out of the, uh, the, the oven. Um, basically, I'm just using one of these Dremel sanding drums, 120 grit and, um, you know, a rotary tool. And I just wanted to show real quick kind of the technique that I use. I'm not going to turn this on, but when I've got one of the sanding drums in there, I'll basically hold, hold everything like this. And, uh, there's a bit of a technique as, uh, I, I try to keep this stationary and just try to move the ball through the drum. And every once in a while, you have to move this a little bit. But, uh, you know, find your own technique, whatever's comfortable. The key, and this is the, the big thing I didn't talk about in the first video, is I only do a couple balls at a time because you start to get some fatigue in holding everything like this and trying to be real careful. And the, the key with this whole process is making sure that you don't let the sanding drum or the buffing drum rest on the ball or press into the ball too much because you'll easily take away material. In fact, you can see right here where I got a little careless. I don't know if that's showing up or not, but I got a little careless here, and uh, that's not as clean as it could be if I had just taken my time. So you want to be patient. You want to have some stamina when you're doing this. So I only do a couple balls at a time, and when I start to feel tired or like I'm you know, getting impatient, then I just set it down because otherwise you're going to make mistakes. I'll show you this real quick. So this ball just came out of the freezer. It's pretty cold. It's actually been in there for almost two weeks at this point. And uh, like I was saying earlier, I didn't notice a difference in mold quality or, or pattern consistency or anything like that by leaving this in the freezer until I was ready to put it in the mold. Um, my theory is that when the ball's in the freezer, it shrinks just enough to fit into the mold tighter, you know, so that the entire pattern is, is touching the ball rather than, you know, maybe three quarters of a certain spot which was the problem I was having in the very beginning before I started putting the balls in the freezer. I just put a you know room temperature ball straight in the mold and most of the pattern would show up, but there would be a spot maybe on the pole or you know different spots where you could tell that the pattern just wasn't resting on the ball completely. So this avoids that. Um, but yeah, what I'll do is just drop the ball and doesn't matter how you put it in there. Um, but what is important is that you wanna make sure that these two pieces match up so that the pattern on the inside is the same. And so what I'll do is just kind of eyeball that. And you can see right away how well that ball fits. In fact, before I do this, if I can get this out, I just want to show you what a room temperature ball looks like in the mold. And I'm going to do this carefully because I don't want to get it stuck. But basically, the ball doesn't slide in, first of all. And then you see that's you know, until you start to really push it together, that's how much of a gap there is between the molds. Uh, so this is a room temperature ball. Same ball, by the way, Callaway Super Soft. Look at that. So that shows you how much the freezer shrinks the ball in order for the pattern to kind of close. And I haven't even tried to make this tight yet. A couple people have asked me, what other balls can you use in the mold? And uh, I've tried a couple since that video. Uh, so that video was Wilson Zip Balls. Um, what I've gravitated towards since then are Callaway Super Softs. And I was just playing those without the mold, but I figured I would try it because it, I, I, it didn't seem like it could be too much different of a material on the outside uh, compared to the zip. And I was right. Uh, the, the Callaway Super Softs work really well in the mold. Um, you can see that they've taken the pattern very well. And they go through the same process as the zip, which is basically uh, 375 degrees for 12 minutes in this toaster oven. Uh, I put the ball inside here, clamp it, put it in there, and then I let the, um, after it's done, I let it cool in the mold until it's, I can pick it up basically. So room temperature again. And then I'll put this in the freezer so that it can loosen up the ball again and shrink it to just pop right out without any trouble. So there are my golf balls sitting next to the ice cream, which is the right spot for them. Let's take the mold out. That is cold. 
as you can see, the ball just comes right out. And that's pretty good. And a really minimal line around the equator. So this is probably the best one that's ever turned out. That's the Callaway Super Soft. This is the High Viz Green Super Soft. And um, this one actually left a little bit of green residue in the mold. So I had to take some steel wool and kind of scrub that out because the next ball that I did had a bit of a stain on it, um, the, a bit of a green stain. But uh, I was happy to see that this one worked because this, this is a good ball for winter play or in the fall even. Um, sometimes it's easier to find these balls uh, in the leaves. And then finally, someone asked if the Wilson Duo Soft performs well in the mold, and this is one of those. And uh, yeah, I would say that it, it took the pattern pretty well all the way around. Um, again, there was something in the mold. That's why, you know, this is a good example of you want to make sure the mold is clean, because if there's anything in there, it'll get baked into the ball and discolor it. So always make sure to take some steel wool or something to scrub out the, the uh, inside of the mold. But... Um, yeah, otherwise I'm real happy with this one. This is the Duo Soft. So I've tried three different balls at this point, and all have come out very well using the same process. Um, and uh, yeah, people ask me all the time where they can find one of these molds. I got really lucky with this one. I found it on eBay, um, and uh, no one else had bid on it yet. Uh, so I kind of got a steal on this. Um, I haven't seen one on eBay since. Uh, you often see the dimple pattern molds pop up on eBay. Um, and those are cool in their own right. Uh, you're basically making a 1950s, 1960s era dimple ball with those. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a good first step until you find one of the uh, antique mesh pattern. Um, and my next goal is to try to find a line cut gutta percha mold. But uh, those are really hard to find and pretty expensive when you do. So, uh, yeah, that'll wrap up um, this week's video. Thanks for watching. Uh, I'll be back next week with another video, and uh, as always, please like and subscribe.